The title of my presentation will be uh, World Bank Role in uh, Delivering Global Public Goods. So first of all, let me start by what exactly the World Bank does. We have uh, a new goal or strategy for the World Bank, which has been defined in two uh, types of targets. The first target is to end extreme poverty. We define that as the percentage of uh, people in the world living on less than $1.25. That is the international benchmark for poverty. Anybody who earns less than $1.25 uh, in order to feed himself or herself or their family is technically defined as poor. Now, of course, that is the global index. It means in Georgia, that it will actually be a little bit more than $1.25. $1.25 is for those countries, the poorest countries in the world, and basically what it equates to is the minimum amount of money you need to buy sufficient calories to survive every day. So for Georgia, this will probably mean something around $2.50 uh, in order to survive on the very basic supplements. 
needed uh, to have a, a meaningful life. The second target is to boost shared prosperity. Shared prosperity meaning increasing the numbers of people who will gain as the economy grows. Gain in terms of, if we measure it in terms of earnings, their annual earnings will increase. We define that as the percentage of people, 40% uh, of the people the bottom 40% of the people will see their average income increase as part of our development programs in the world. Of course, achieving this goal means that uh, we are going to have to ensure the sustainable uh, fiscal policies. Fiscal policies meaning what the Ministry of Finance and the National Bank of Georgia does, meaning there will be sustainable environment and also sustainable social structures. Sustainable development as such will mean a number of uh, sectors or areas will have to be involved in the development uh, of uh, the economy. Uh, the private sector plays a key role. I think most of you know that the private sector contributes at least around, let me say, around 90% of uh, jobs are created by the private sector. There has to be physical and human development. Uh, by that we mean education and health, uh, well-being of the nation has to improve. Otherwise, an economy cannot grow. There has to be strong institutions. Uh, your ministries, your government departments should be able to implement policies of the government that will encourage growth of the economy. There has to be inclusion. And inclusion meaning uh, gender, men and women, have to make equal, have to have equal opportunity to contribute to growth. They don't have to do exactly the same thing, but they have to have equal opportunity uh, to be able to contribute to growth. And of course, finally, sustainability, as we mentioned. The World Bank will be selective in the way that we apply all of this. We will not be engaged in all of the uh, different sectors, but we will be selective in focusing our uh, investments. So, first of all, we need to sharpen our own focus on what we can do uh, to improve uh, the lives of the world. We will work with large and small countries, uh, we will work with rich and poor countries the same, and we will also provide uh, customized financing solutions, not only in terms of uh, uh, what we lend, but primarily in terms of how uh, we lend and how we support economies to grow. Uh, the emphasis on all this will be what I would call tr transformative growth. We want to make sure that the little that we provide to an economy will actually transform the growth of a nation uh, into, uh, from a poor country, a middle income, to a rich country. The clients that we serve tend to be very diverse. As I mentioned, we have small, large, poor, rich countries, but also within a country, the clients that we have can be private, they can be public. Private, as you know, uh, firms, companies. <coughs> public, meaning the government, representing the nation. We also have subnational governments, local governments, and in some cases, we also deal with uh, state-owned enterprises. Although not uh, very much in Georgia, uh, in other countries, we do support uh, state-owned enterprises, state-owned meaning entirely owned uh, by the country. We try to tailor our development solutions to meet the specific needs of the country. And then finally, what I'm going to focus on today is our role in the international uh, community. Uh, I think in Georgia, in previous lectures, for those of you who may have attended previous lectures, you will have heard of specific activities that the World Bank does. What I'd like to focus today is on what we do in the international uh, community and what we call global public goods. The definition of global public goods is really providing knowledge Knowledge meaning technical expertise, 
that will influence decisions and policies taken at a global level. So it's not for individual countries, but rather international. And then countries may adapt those to their specific needs. What I'm going to focus on are what we call the World Development Reports, or WDRs. These are annual reports produced by the World Bank on very specific topics that do an in-depth analysis of the economy or the development challenges that the world as a whole is facing. And we've lost the uh, presentation. Not, not from here, I think, the power. Here we go. Well, I will just talk and try to explain as, as much as possible. In which case, what I'm going to do, normally I just make a presentation without looking at my slides, but uh, since the power is off, I'm going to have to read some of it. The World Development Reports, as I mentioned, really provide uh, in-depth analysis of uh, specific issues, selected specific issues that are pertinent for the time. Uh, each annual report is really done over effectively two years research period and produces recommendations that we believe will challenge the world to take steps to improve the livelihoods, not only of people in one country, but across the entire uh, world. We've had a number of these WDRs going back almost 30 years. The ones that I'd like to talk about, uh, first of all, is uh, climate change. We had a WDR in 2010 that focused on climate change and the impact of climate change on the world economies, on world development, and the future of the world. In 2011, we had uh, WDR focusing on conflict, security, and development. And here, the message was, how does conflict, in other words, wars in particular, affect economic growth? How does it affect poverty? In 2012, we had a WDR looking at gender equality uh, in terms of what are the differences between men and women in this world. How do different countries treat women in particular? Uh, this year, the WDR is on jobs. What do countries need to do to increase employment in various aspects? And then next year, the WDR will be on managing risks for development. Uh, those of you who come from Kaheti, uh, you probably know last year there was a heavy hailstorm with winds that destroyed a lot of agricultural crops. That, in a way, is a risk for development because the people in Kaheti suffered a major distortion of their livelihoods. What can a country do to manage risks resulting from something like that. So let's start with the, the WDR on jobs. This specific WDR stresses the role of the private sector. If you want to increase employment in a country, then you need to do, you need to do more to strengthen uh, your private sector. You need to do more to increase uh, private sector uh, to thrive and it is the private sector that offers 90% of jobs in any country. We believe that jobs drive development and therefore they should not be an afterthought. They should not be something that a government does afterwards. It should be centered to the strategy for developing a country. We should have, as part of Georgia's development strategy, we should have a strategy for jobs. What do young graduates need in order to find jobs? Have you asked yourselves 
What are you going to be doing after you graduate? What type of job do you want? What has your government done to help you to find a job once you graduate? But more importantly, what have you done to be able to find a job once you graduate? So these are the questions that this WDR asks for all countries, not just Georgia. What it finds is that not one size fits all. This is a very common cliche used in English, meaning that each country will have to have a tailored solution for its specific needs. You cannot take what works in Colombia and expect that it will work in Georgia. However, some of the aspects of what works in Colombia or in Venezuela or in uh, Brazil or in China may work in Georgia. So the question then is how can we use the experiences that other countries have had in order to uh, increase employment uh, in these countries. One of the key lessons from uh, the WDR is that most countries face the problem about jobs. 600 million jobs will be required to keep up with the current employment rates. So over the next 15 years, the world as a whole needs to generate 600 million new jobs. Georgia probably needs to generate a few hundred thousand of those jobs in addition to the current number of jobs available in Georgia. Out of this, 621 million of the youth that is defined as people under the age of 25, generally 15 to 24, are not working and they are not studying around the world. So the youth are probably the most affected. The other affected group are women. A lot of women do not have jobs or do not even have the opportunities for jobs. But we will see that in a separate uh, WDR. So the key policy questions, if I was discussing this with the Prime Minister of Georgia, the key questions I would be asking the Prime Minister, what are the strategies that you have for increasing jobs in Georgia? How can you help the private sector, the entrepreneurs, to open up new companies that will employ people? What policies do you have that will cement social cohesion? that make sure that people work together. What type of skills are needed by the young, in particular, in Georgia? And what jobs will be available? And how do you match the skills to the jobs? How will you attract foreign direct investment? And how will you make sure that those competing for jobs have the right skills to match with those jobs? And how will you protect the workers? The owners of firms, they have the power, they have the money, but how do you make sure that they will treat the workers the right way? And how can job relocation, reallocation be accelerated? In other words, how can you make sure that companies can actually hire and fire in order to maintain their leading edge? But perhaps the first question, really, that we need to answer, especially in an academic institution like this one, what is a job? What does it actually mean to have a job? And I think most people would probably take the first one and say a job is something that pays you a wage, that gives you an earning, a fixed earning. Well, I would say that it's actually more than that. A job, an employment, is a mechanism of occupation that generates income for whoever is doing that job. A job can therefore be from, waged, from wages, jobs that pay monthly, weekly, annual wages, and also jobs that you employ yourself for the self-employed. And in Georgia, farming is probably the largest 
It's about 46% on its own of employment in Georgia. Employment meaning in terms of jobs. I've used those two words interchangeably, but technically they're not. But for purposes of today, let's take it as such. I mentioned earlier that the problem will be the youth. Perhaps not in Europe, but certainly in South Asia, Africa, East Asia, and the Pacific, there is a huge problem coming in the next few years because the size of the youth is growing. If we look at the graph on the right, look at Pakistan, for example, you have 60%, or just under 60%, are the youth who are not employed. Georgia is not as bad, but Georgia, it's about 35% of the youth. We look at the inequalities of the labor market. This simply means that this graph is showing Georgia, and it simply means that you're better off with some form of education in Georgia. Because uh, the green part shows those with education who are unemployed. Okay. So a smaller percentage of those who have some form of formal education with a certification are unemployed. Those without, in other words, those with less skills, are the most disadvantaged. The inequalities is much higher. In other words, make sure you complete your education before you leave. Jobs drive development. We believe uh, that jobs really improve living standards, the productivity of a nation, and also contribute to social cohesion. Here what we're showing is what I said earlier, that private sector actually leads most to employment. If we look at uh, Ethiopia, and this only looks at micro-enterprises. Micro-enterprises defined as companies with less than 100 uh, employees. In fact, micro is less than 10. Uh, medium is less than 100 employees. In Ethiopia, it's close to 100% of all employment is from micro enterprises. I, in other words, firms with less than 10 uh, employees. What do governments, what is the role of government in ensuring that there will be jobs? Number one, they should know what the priorities are. They should know what works for Georgia and therefore have in place a strategy that will help Georgia to offset constraints that affect its economy. What are the constraints as far as Georgia is concerned? Investment. We need to increase the level of investment in the country in order to have firms or companies that are able to employ. The government needs to put in place labor policies that are pro-employment, that will help companies to employ more people. But perhaps most important, the building block to all this, the foundation to all this, what we call the fundamentals, are the macroeconomic stability. If a country does not have a stable economic policy, that means you'll have inflation, you'll have uh, a collapse of various uh, systems, and you will not be able to attract all the investments that you need. There needs to be the human capital. What you're doing at this university is developing human capital. There needs to be the rule of law to make sure that any firm or company that owns properties or produces goods has the right of ownership of those goods and services. How does this impact Georgia in particular? If we take, first of all, the income level, Georgia is what we call lower middle income, and somewhere towards the middle of this uh, chart, the most important for Georgia is access to finance. In other words, companies, small companies in particular in Georgia, need to be able to borrow at a reasonable rate. Companies at the moment are not able to borrow from banks at a reasonable rate and therefore they are not able to expand. 
expansion means more jobs for people. So one of the important things we're doing with the government uh, in Georgia is working on uh, increasing access to finance. I'd like to now look at the next, uh, or rather, 2012 WDR, which focused on gender. And this one I thought would be interesting because it should challenge you as students and staff of the university on what we can do to bring about gender equality. How many of you would believe that men and women are equal? It should be 100%. Okay, we should all, we're all equal. Okay? But the question is, do we have equal opportunities? And that is really the question that you should be asking yourselves as soon as you walk out of this university for the young men and young women if you all went to apply for a job would you be presented with the same opportunity of employment whether you are a man or a woman in the last 20 years and i think georgia is no exception university enrollment for women has grown seven times I don't know the statistic for Georgia, but looking around this particular audience, I would say it's more than 51% of the audience are women. Now, I don't know if that is reflected in the overall university numbers, but that has been a trend, particularly in the developed world, and also in the developing countries, middle income and low uh, middle income as well. However, worldwide, 35 million girls are still out of school. When we look at, when we break this down in terms of primary school enrollment, we see that in much of Europe and Central Asia, Latin America, Asia and Pacific, there is about equal enrollment in primary schools between boys and girls. But there are certain parts of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, where this is not the case, and also in South Asia. South Asia for us means India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. In those particular groups of countries, there are far fewer girls registering in primary school than boys. In secondary schools, similar trend. And in Europe and Central Asia, what we call ECA, or ECA. The girls are still disadvantaged in several countries. The countries that I mentioned earlier, but even more so among minorities. Uh, the Roma being one particular minority across Europe, where the statistics show that the impact of segregation is actually bigger. In tertiary education, however, the figures are a lot better for women. Women are much more likely to complete tertiary education, what you're doing here is tertiary education, than our boys. Maybe during the question and answers you might be able to tell me why uh, I would say 70% of the audience here uh, are girls and where are the boys? What are they doing? And maybe they're playing with the toys. I saw some nice toys in the laboratories. I don't know. But you can tell me why there is this reversal. There are more girls in tertiary education than there are boys. However, that trend will mean that in a few years, there will be a reversal. Right now, what we see in terms of wages, linking back to the jobs uh, WDR, despite the higher number of women in tertiary education, average wage for women is lower than that of men. So I'd like, again, during the question and answers, for you to tell me, why is it in Georgia that women, on average, earn less than men? Let's look at some of the more worrying trends 
In low and middle income countries, life expense expectancy for women has increased by 20 years. And yet, women and girls die more compared to boys. Almost four, more, four million more women die than do boys and girls, uh, than do boys and men. There is an excessive female mortality in the developing world, and especially infants. In Georgia, what we call the missing women syndrome, out of every 100,000 born, in Georgia, there are about 5,000 women missing. Why? Is there selective gender selection at pregnancy and birth? Why? So I'd like to challenge you to think, why in Georgia there are fewer women being born, fewer baby girls being born than baby boys? Naturally, it should be 50-50. But why is it? that there is at least a 5% difference for babies, baby girls. In the last 30 years, 552 million women have joined the labor force, and now four out of every 10 uh, workers are women. And yet, as I mentioned earlier, women earn less than men across the world. Europe and Central Asia, the number of labor force has increased in around, around the world, uh, the best being Latin America and the Caribbean, 16% increase in the labor force of women. There has been a slight decline in Europe and Central Asia and the East Asia and Pacific regions. But when we look at the earnings, for every dollar that a man earns, a woman earns 80 cents or 80 percent in Mexico. Germany, many of you would think Germany is a very advanced country. It is an advanced country. But women on average earn 62 percent of what men earn. Bangladesh is probably the worst. Women earn only 12 percent of what men earn. So I'd like, in the question and answers, your thoughts on why? Why do you think this is tolerable in those societies? Is it tolerable in Georgia? Would you, since there are the majority of girls here, would you accept a job that pays you less than another graduate who is a, a man or a boy? Unfortunately, these trends are not only in foreign parts of the world. We have similar situations closer to home in Europe and Central Asia. 19% less in terms of EU, traditional EU 10 countries, the first group. In Central Asia, 24% less. This is what we call the wage gap, the difference in average wage, wage earnings between men and women. In Russia, 29%. Western Balkans, uh, meaning Serbia, uh, Bosnia, and so on. Former Yugoslavia, primarily 41% less. There is also the question about violence against women. Although many countries, in fact all countries except six, have ratified uh, the UN Convention on the Elimination of uh, discrimination and violence against women, there are still 510 million women that are abused every year by their partners, not every year, but during their lifetime. And some of it in the most surprising countries. Japan, 13% of women reported abuse. In Japan, that works out at 260,000 women have had some form of domestic violence. 
Inequality, in other words, the lack of equal opportunity, actually has a cost. It means, in this case, that if we were to give equal opportunity, for example, if you're a farmer, a low-income farmer, you're provided with inputs, fertilizers, seeds, and so on. If you provided that equally to men and women in a lot of developing countries, you would see a 2-4% to increase in output, national output. So effectively, growth of that sector in GDP terms would be 2-4%. to If we, we could eliminate employment segregation, in other words, differences between men and women, we would increase labor productivity by 3-5%. 3-25%. to 5 <coughs> 3 to 25%. In Georgia, by 22%. Most of you, I usually ask a fairly emotion, emotional question. Who is the better of your parents in looking after you when you're young? How many would say fathers? How many would say mothers? Okay. In most countries, it is actually the mother. When you give control to household incomes to women, spending patterns change in favor of children. In other words, the children are better off <coughs> if the mother has control, or at least some control, of family earnings. Educated women tend to invest more in their children and also, violence is less against women. It also leads to suboptimal institutions. In India, when women became more proactive in uh, politics, there was greater investment in water. Even in the US, when voting rights were given to women, infant mortality reduced by 8 to 15 percent. So these are not myths. These are actually statistical figures that show the impact of inequality. We then go into why do these gaps happen. It's a matter of policies, uh, the types of institutions that you have, household structures and so on. I will not go into all of these in detail, but what I'd like to do is to just give you a taste of what needs to be done to eliminate these gender gaps. Reduce the human development gap. In other words, give equal opportunity in education and healthcare to men and women. When we talk of gender, it doesn't mean you should start discriminating against the men. It doesn't mean give less healthcare to men. What it actually means is give more opportunity, equal opportunity. To women. Make sure that earnings are the same, that the same job done, the same earnings are given to women. Give more voice to women. What is the percent of women in the Georgian parliament today? I bet it's not 50%. So there is still some work to be done. There are very few countries where it's close to 50%. So it's not just Georgia, but it's throughout the world. Try to find what are the causes of these inequality and focus on those. There are several actions that you can take. I've mentioned education. Uh, we can improve healthcare. We can improve employment opportunities and so on. But I'd like to give you a sense of some of the things that a nation, a country, a government can do. We can target infrastructure investments like water, electricity, transport, even ICT that will help to promote women and give them equal opportunity as men. Improve child care so that particularly young mothers can either go to school, hopefully they've already finished, if they haven't, they can go to school, but more importantly, they can have job opportunities. They do not have to take part-time work, 
but they can take full-time employment as well. For those in farming, ensure they have the rights to land just as equal as men. And also have access to credit, to finance, just as men do. Give opportunities for types of jobs that are traditionally thought of as for men only. And reduce biases in service delivery. Okay, let's go to the next one, which was on conflict. I will not go into the details too much on this one, but rather to explain what this particular WDR focused on, which was really the practical options on how to address conflict and violence in particular in order to build fragile economies. About 1.5 billion people live in countries that are affected by some form of political or uh, criminal violence. And most of these end up being countries that are fragile in terms of their economy, in terms of their economy, in terms of their political uh, setup. Fixing these political and economic fragility actually requires both international and, more importantly, national leadership to be engaged in creating an atmosphere of the rule of law, where justice applies, where job opportunities exist, both men and women, and where the economy is able to attract investments from outside. We have a number of statistics that show the deaths from civil wars and other forms of violence. These have been declining over the past two decades or so, in fact more over the past four decades or so, but nevertheless in certain parts of the world conflicts tend to flare up from time to time. I'd like to just focus on one aspect of the impact of violence, and that is looking at growth, economic growth, of those countries with or without conflict. The red line shows countries that are affected by major violence. And we can see that the poverty level, in terms of headcount, over 60% of the population live on less than $1.25. Countries that are affected by conflict also tend to be the poorest countries in the world, with the largest numbers of extreme poor. Countries that have less violence, even if they started at the same point in 1981, this compares a group of countries that had the same levels of violence in 1981. And about 25 years later, we compare the economies of those countries, and this graph shows the difference. <laughs> Those where there have been no repeated conflicts, economies grow much faster to the point where now less than 40% of the population could be counted as extreme poor. So the key message, avoid conflict, and countries that do not have conflict should help those that do in order to ensure that there's growth, not only in their own countries, but in the countries, the neighboring countries, or countries of the sub-region, where conflict has been persistent. I'm going to skip the next two slides, three slides, and go to the last WDR that I'd like to talk about this afternoon, which is climate change. I think all of you have heard about impact of climate change. And I'm hoping that you've heard about it because the World Bank did the WDR in 2010. A climate smart world is possible if we act now, if we act together, and we act differently. The most important message is that developing countries in particular are vulnerable to climate change. Georgia's economy will be affected because with climate change, the agricultural sector 
will suffer the most. So we need policies that will be smart to ensure that the drivers of climate change, which tends to be fossil fuel emissions, are eliminated. This is where the biggest focus has been. Global warming is the consequence of emissions, hydrocarbon emissions in particular. Now let's break this down into who are the main culprits of the cause of climate change. It is not actually Georgia, it is not actually a lot of the poorer countries. Most of the contributors to climate change are from the developed countries. Here we see that in high income countries they generate by far the greatest amount of emissions than other countries, the low income countries or the middle income countries. At the same time, when we look at this in terms of, uh, I'm going to skip to the next one, we look at it in terms of specific behaviors. Uh, the US has a tendency to drive four wheel, I think we call them Jeeps here, four wheel drives or SUVs, sports utility vehicles as they call them in the US which generate a lot of emissions. The study, the WDR found that actually if you could persuade most car owners in the US to give up their SUVs and drive fuel efficient Japanese or European made vehicles, the Volkswagens, uh, VWs of this world and so on, the Nissans and the Toyotas, the impact of the reduction in emissions could be the same as generating power, the emissions from generating power in all developing countries, generating electricity, if you wish. So in other words, the onus is more on the richer countries to do more, to reduce, uh, to fight the impacts of global warming than poorer countries. On agriculture, the red shows what will happen by 2050 in terms of reduction in yields at the current rate of global warming. Only a few countries in Europe, North America, central parts of Asia will be able to produce food sufficiently to feed their populations. The rest of the world shown in red will not be able to feed their population. What will the world look like? The current, I should say not current, but the estimation in 2010 was that global warming would lead to a 2%, a 2 degree increase in temperatures by 2050. 2 degrees by 2050 simply means that we will have a lot of oceans, sea rise in the oceans. It means agricultural productivity will fall. But 2%, it turns out, or 2 degrees, it turns out, is actually a very conservative estimate. The latest estimates show that global warming will most likely lead to about 5% increase, 5 degrees, why do I keep calling it percent? 5 degrees increase in temperature. 5 degree increase in temperature will mean a significant rise in sea levels, a significant rise in CO2 concentrations, significant reduction in agricultural productivity. In other words, we might all start to look for another planet to live on because by 2050, or at least by 2100, this Earth as we know it will have changed beyond recognition. Now, I'm going to focus the last slide on what can be done according to that WDR. The first thing is we need to change the way we live. 
I see in this university that you use energy efficient bulbs. So I can see you have fluorescent tubes. These are much better in terms of energy consumption than the old types of what we call incandescent bulbs. The bulbs that had wires running through them and generated light by heating those wires to generate light. The second is to use renewable energy, hydropower. Georgia has significant potential for generating electricity from hydro uh, power instead of coal and gas. There's still a lot of countries that use coal and gas to generate electricity. That needs to be changed. Nuclear. Nuclear has a bad name since what happened in Japan, but nevertheless, it is still much cleaner if it doesn't break down. Fossil fuel capture systems where you capture the emissions and store them in the ground. Increase what we call fossil fuel emission sinks, basically meaning forests, increase forest coverage. And there are other mechanisms to capture greenhouse gases. If we do all of those measures, then the two degree trajectory will be achieved by around 2080. In other words, in another 70, 75 years from now. Okay, I hope I wasn't the bearer of bad news, closing with that slide, in terms of what the world will look like in 2050. But nevertheless, I hope I have at least generated some thinking on your part of what you need to be doing on climate change, gender equality, hopefully not gender inequality, on what you need to be doing about jobs and on conflict. There are several other WGRs that we've done over the past 30 years or so that are available from our website. I'm now happy to take uh, questions if there are any. Thank you.
promote prosperity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let me maybe answer this one and we'll have another question or at least opportunity for questions. Uh, as I understood it, your question is asking about the perceptions about the World Bank and in particular the World Bank is seen as promoting uh, capitalism in particular. I think the answer to that in maybe which is true but I mean wild capital. Okay. Um, I think first of all, I would say that we do not promote capitalism for the sake of capitalism, in terms of wild capitalism, as, as we call it. <coughs> what we would promote, what I would say we promote is responsible development. You will have seen in the jobs uh, WDR that around 90% of jobs are created by the private sector. The government employs, or the government or public sector in general, employs 10% or a maximum of 15%, 15, 15.15% in most countries. In other words, if you want to increase employment, you're going to have to give the private sector an opportunity to increase <coughs> its own uh, influence on the economy, what we call its contribution uh, to the economy. And this is really the main reason why the World Bank would promote the development of the private sector, because the private sector is the engine of uh, economic growth. The question about the perception about the World Bank is a lot more difficult to answer. There have been, I think many of you may have seen in the uh, television news and other places, newspapers and so on, there have been demonstrations against the World Bank, in particular Washington, and that is because of what uh, a lot of civil society believes as the overstepping of uh, multinationals. Multinationals meaning the powerful large companies that tend to control not only the lives of individuals but in some cases also control governments. So globalization uh, meaning large multinational companies having access to global economies having, in fact, I would say, almost control on global economies was seen as a negative thing. We actually do agree with that. So if you look at our lending policies, you will hardly find any World Bank support to global multinational companies. Most, if not all, our support is focused on small and medium-sized enterprises, local companies in countries like Georgia that we hope will be able to grow and provide employment. So I'm not necessarily saying that people are wrong to demonstrate against the World Bank as far as the uh, issue of globalization is concerned, but what I'm saying is the actual practice of what we do tends to focus more on the smaller firms or companies than, if at all, on the large multinationals. Any other question? I have one. I have a question about uh, gender equality. For example, in uh, our university, I have certain things certainly when I was a student. Uh, in the that faculty, we had uh, at least uh, one girl per uh, ten boys. So, uh, this time it was uh, thought that veterinary is a masculine profession, that veterinarian should handle the animals with bare hands and uh, put it on the knees, etc. So, 
But uh, today is another situation. For example, it's, uh, this profession is mostly, mostly intellectual job than physical job. So that uh, situation changes. And uh, now, uh, proportion, proportion is 50-50 uh, per boys and girls at the day So that's, I think it's the same in the whole world because uh, some professions are strictly masculine profession. That means physical work, but uh, some professions are most uh, like that to unisex professions that is not needed some physical work, etc. So that's probably the reason why it changes the situation. Thanks. Um, the, it may be true that some types of jobs require physical <coughs> work and uh, that men maybe are better suited. We don't argue that that kind of uh, specialization, if you call it that. We don't argue against specialization. What we do say, however, that if you have a strong woman <laughs> who wants to be a veterinary uh, scientist, that woman should have the opportunity. So the issue is equal opportunity. So the opportunity provided should not prevent a woman or a boy or a man from doing something that they feel, they themselves feel that they can do. So the issue is precisely that, giving equal opportunity, not necessarily the same, but equal opportunity. Thanks. Well, thank you all very much. I hope you found uh, this interesting. We will make available the slides and also we will send the links where you can download uh, the full WDRs and it's probably better off downloading the executive summaries because the full WDR is probably 100 uh, megabytes or something, 150 megabytes or something. The executive summaries are probably five or six megabytes, so you can easily download those. But if you go to worldbank.org and type WDR, you should be able to find them. But in any case, we'll make available the set of slides and also the links uh, for these reports. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it.